Um, so thanks everybody for joining us for these office hours with the Arctic section um, and the Office of Polar Programs at NSF. Uh, so we'll be moving through uh, the slides that we have prepared and then at the end there's going to be plenty of time for a question and answer. Um, I think everybody's used to Zoom now, so feel free to uh, raise your hand at the end and we'll call on you or put the question in the chat. Um, uh, or you can, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can private message uh, me at the end. And uh, if you want to submit something anonymously, anonymously, and we'll make sure it is answered. So with that, I'll pass it off to Colleen Strahacker. Thanks, Kate. And hi, everyone. Welcome. It's good to see so many names and hopefully some questions later on. So I'm Colleen Strahacker. I'm a program officer in the Arctic Sciences section. And um, we have a lot of new leadership changes in our section we're really excited to announce. So first, we have a new director of the Office of Polar Programs, Dr. Roberta Marinelli. She comes to us from Oregon State um, and has a lot of experience on the NSF side of things. She um, was a program officer before going um, back to academia, and we're really excited to have her on board. Um, and as of today, we have a new section head. So as many of you know, um, our former section head, Simon Stevenson, retired um, back at the end of February, and we have been conducting a search for a new section head. And today, um, it has been announced that um, Dr. Jennifer Mercer is our new section head, and we're very excited to have her and excited for the future of Arctic Sciences at NSF. So Jen, why don't I hand it over to you to take over? Thanks, Colleen. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, many I've been scrolling through the attendance list here, and I think many of you know me and I know you. Um, for those who don't, I look forward to meeting you. So please don't hesitate to introduce yourselves at meetings or conferences or um, send me an email. Um, and uh, as Colleen said, we've had a lot of turnover. I am really honored and excited to be taking on this new role. I think it comes at a time when um, uh, you know, I have the opportunity to bring new ideas into leadership of Arctic research. And as we all know, um, and why we're here today is that the Arctic is extremely important for so many reasons, scientific understanding, climate change, national security, environmental stewardship, and especially the well-being of the many communities and residents throughout the Arctic. Um, I can speak to, uh, as I said, there's been a lot of turnover in the leadership of OPP, and I'm really looking forward to working with our new leadership team. Uh, Roberta Marinelli has taken the reins, and uh, she has a lot of polar experience. She's been really fantastic to work with so far, so that's exciting. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize and thank Renee Crane for her interim leadership throughout the last several months. And last but not least, a leader is only as good as the team they lead, so I really appreciate our whole section. Um, and I think I'll be introducing some of our new staff in the next slide here um, as we go through this presentation. So thanks again, Colleen. And I, I'm really looking forward to working with the whole community in this capacity. All right, and I'll uh, take this slide as well. So we have, um, we have a fantastic team, as I just said. And it is an honor to lead this entire group of people. A few people that we want to introduce um, that have come on and joined our team this uh, just in the past few months. First of all is uh, Reiner Ammon, who's joined the Arctic Natural Sciences uh, Program as an IPA. Um, Dr. Olivia Lee has joined the Arctic Observing Network Program, also as an IPA. And Dr. Kelly Brunt has joined the Arctic System Science Program. She shared with uh, the Antarctic Program, however, and she'll be doing glaciology across both um, programs as well. Uh, so she has also joined us as an IPA. And then um, uh, Shoko Shinbrat has joined us as the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow uh, just recently. And so I, do you guys want to, uh, maybe we can just take a second and if you're on, is Reiner on? You can come on camera and uh, say hello. So people can put a name to a face. If we don't have Reiner, let's go to Olivia. I'm here. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to say hello for a second? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like people, since, since we're in the Zoom world, it's good for people to see you and hear you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Reiner Amon. I'm a IPA. That means I've been rotating in for a couple of years as a program director in the Arctic Natural Sciences. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> In my real life, I'm a, a professor at Texas A&M. My research is focused obviously on the Arctic Ocean and Siberia, working on uh, carbon cycling. So I'm a biogeochemist. Hope Thanks, to see Reiner. you around. Excellent. And Olivia. 
Thanks, Jen. Hi, I'm Olivia Lee. I'm also a rotator from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, we will also be having an IARPIC talk at the Arctic Observing Network program um, in November. So looking forward to meeting with you all there as well. And I'm not sure, uh, Kelly, are you on? I know you were taking the day off. I, I am, you thank are. you, Jen. Uh, I'm here, uh, as Jen pointed out, I'm shared with between our, the Arctic side and Arctic system sciences, and also the Antarctic side and Antarctic glaciology, for those of you in the know, helping Paul Cutler. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. And, and Shoko. She had put a put note a, in the chat yep. saying, yeah. So I'll go ahead and read it. There's a lot of background noise. So she's she's waving and she's gonna keep offline, uh, but she comes to us uh, with a background in conservation social scientist uh, new to the Arctic space, but we're very glad to have her and feel lucky that she chose to spend her fellowship with us. Um, okay, I'll pull, go ahead and put the slides back up. Thank you, great. And I think we can go on to the next slide. And I think these are, this one's Greg. Yeah, thanks everybody. I'm Greg Anderson with the Arctic System Science Program. And I get to, to tell you, uh, I'm not going to read this entire long list of opportunities to you, but I will highlight a few uh, in particular, because as Bev has just put in, you can see this list online as well. Um, our Arctic Research Opportunities Solicitation, that's the main solicitation for the Arctic section is active. We are having another webinar as, uh, as uh, Olivia said on November 2nd for the uh, Arctic Observing Network program. Um, and this is a, you know, if you have any questions about any programs in the Arctic section, this is our main solicitation. This is the place that we spend a lot of time. Uh, I'm very happy to say, although I really feel like Colleen ought to be making this announcement in particular, that the new Navigating the New Arctic NNA solicitation just came out. Although you can't actually read it yet, you can find out what the deadline is, uh, which is in February of 2022. The solicitation itself will be visible probably by the end of the day. Uh, and then we have a variety of other opportunities that are available. Um, we have an upcoming deadline in December for the Arctic uh, Doctoral Dissertation Research Improvement Grants. There's a few of the, of the uh, programs that accept those, and you can see the list here. Um, we have a Dear Colleague letter that's still out for community hubs for collaboration uh, between NSF-funded Arctic researchers and Arctic residents. Uh, and then um, we have the IUs, Improving Undergraduate STEM Education uh, Pathways, Pathways competition is open and Lisa Rome is our contact there, uh, as well as for the next one, which is suppo supporting uh, support for engaging students and the public in polar research. And this is a way of getting people to be able to participate a bit more broadly than, um, than some more traditional program paths might be there. The uh, P2C2 or Paleo Perspectives on Climate Change program just had its deadline um, last week, but, uh, but it will, as far as we know, continue. And Frank Rack is our contact there. And we just wanted to highlight these. I'm going to hand it off to Alan Pope, who's got a whole long list of uh, cool cyber infrastructure things to share with us on this slide and the next. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I wanted to mention, I'm sorry, I'm Alan. I'm the program officer for Polar Cyber Infrastructure, so working across both Arctic and Antarctic. Um, and I also try and encourage a lot of the Arctic research community to apply to these other open uh, solicitations in other parts of NSF um, that are, yeah, open to anyone, and it would be great to see more polar participation in those. In particular, there's the Cyber Infrastructure for Sustained Scientific Innovation, or CSSI, program. That has a coming up deadline on December 8th. And we had a recent webinar uh, that is on the, the recording and information I believe is available on the NSF website. Um, the cyber training program or training-based workforce development for advanced cyber infrastructure. Um, that solicitation is currently being updated. You can see the, the prior solicitation on the NSF website um, and we will know 90 days in advance uh, when there is a deadline. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, I wanna remind you of the Dear Colleague letter on research coordination and planning opportunities um, within GEO and artificial intelligence, um, as well as the open solicitations in the Harnessing the Data Revolution uh, NSF big idea. Um, and so I'll, keep talking for a little bit longer in case you want to screenshot this because there's a lot of information available here 
and the slides are also already available on the IARPA Collaborations event page uh, for this event. Um, and you'll find out a little bit more about how to make sure you get information about all of these things later, but you make sure to sign up for email notices as well. Um, I think we can go on to the next slide. And thank you, Liz, to, to putting in the links in the chat there. Um, I also want to remind everyone about this other Dear Colleague letter on polar data and sample reuse. Um, so this Dear Colleague letter uh, encourages submission of proposals that leverage existing data or physical samples or non-physical samples, um, proposals that also facilitate the reuse of existing data or and or leverage and make publicly available data or samples that are currently unavailable or inaccessible. So doing data rescue and reuse projects. Um, so we want to make sure that um, we reuse all of this great data and these great samples that NSF or other organizations have previously invested in, um, and also uh, want to make data as fully compliant with the FAIR and CARE principles for uh, data governance. So that's both for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, as well as the CARE principles for Indigenous data governance. And in general, it's a good reminder that to be an Arctic scientist doesn't mean that you have to be a field scientist. Uh, so we, we provide a lot of different opportunities for ways to be a, an Arctic scientist. So this applies to all areas of Arctic research and um, proposals that align with this Dear Colleague letter can be submitted to the current Arctic solicitation. Next slide, and I think I'm handing it off. Olivia. Hi or Erica, I forget who's doing this next. Thanks, Alan, it's me. Um, I'm Erica Hill and I'm program manager for the Arctic Social Sciences. And I'm gonna talk about uh, three different opportunities for faculty and prospective faculty at different career levels. The first one is the faculty early career development program, the career. This is a five, year support, five years of support for pre-tenure faculty. Oh. Um, who have leadership potential in research and education. So this is a program where you bring us a really well integrated research and educational project that has both the potential to advance science as well as education, often at the undergraduate level, but doesn't have to be restricted to the undergraduate level. Um, it's a very prestigious competition uh, or award to receive but um, we'd love to see more in the Arctic section. You can apply to um, the Arctic science, Arctic natural science, Arctic social science, um, Arctic observing networks, all of those accept uh, career proposals. Uh, the next project is the mid-career advancement um, proposal. It has a February target date, and this is for folks who are tenured. So while career is pre-tenure, the mid-career advancement proposal um, is for tenured uh, sciences faculty, and it provides a 6.5 months of salary, as well as some professional development funding, and it provides the opportunity for folks to go out and establish partnerships and explore new innovative areas to advance their careers. So um, we would really like to see some, some more proposals for mid-career advancement. And again, you can get in touch with any of the program officers for more information. Take a look at the solicitation. If you think it's um, appropriate for you, get in touch with one of us. Next slide, please. And then for those folks who are just starting out, so within um, 24 months of receiving their PhD, we have the Poehler Programs Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. This provides two years of salary and professional development funds. Again, any field of Arctic science, social science, natural science, and it is open to folks who are interested in getting into the Arctic, who have never had Arctic research experience before, as well as to folks who already have um, Arctic research experience, perhaps through their dissertation work. We have a new solicitation that went live today. It's 22-516 and February 7th is our deadline. Um, I hope there are some folks out there who are either hoping to apply for this themselves or maybe have recent PhD students who they think would be good candidates. And we have an informational webinar on November 10th. Feel free to contact me for more information if you're interested, or you can take a look at the OPP-PRF um, website alias right over here on the right-hand side of the slide. 
Thanks. Next slide. So I think I am going to take this one. Um, so we have a number of community resources that the section and other parts of NSF have funded to help make your jobs easier, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so we have two that are, that are definitely relevant to those working in um, data and cyber infrastructure and to help you manage your data. And maybe I'll point to Alan. Alan, do you wanna give a quick overview of the Polar Geospatial Center and the Arctic Data Center? Sure. Um, just really briefly, the Polar Geospatial Center, um, as the name implies, has a whole bunch of different geospatial resources. In particular, um, if you're a federally funded researcher, there's high resolution imagery and tasking for collection of that imagery available. Um, but for anyone, if you're in the NSF polar research area, you can also um, get community support for imagery different applications. There's training available for um, all sorts of different uh, applications. And um, they also host a bunch of openly available data products. The Arctic Data Center similarly um, has a whole bunch of metadata and uh, Arctic data that's been largely funded by NSF. Great, thanks for, for quickly recovering there. Um, I was in the middle, I think, of describing the Arctic Data Center um, and mentioning that they have data portals so you can find particularly tailored uh, collections of data sets or make your own if you have a grouping of data that you want to share. Um, and then they also support different data submission if you need help on developing your data management plan if you're uh, for putting in an NSF proposal um, and then a whole bunch of uh, workshops and training materials as well. Uh, Back to you, Colleen. Great, thank you so much, Alan. And I was one of the people that was booted, so that was a pretty crazy experience. I'm glad you're all still here. Um, so a couple of other uh, resources that we have for the community. One is ARCUS, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. Um, they've been around for quite some time. The section funds them to do a lot of things like community building, um, getting the word out on different things that NSF researchers and the section has been up to, um, different uh, newsletters and lectures and things like that. So they're a really wonderful resource. I know I, I kind of go into the ARCUS website to check out their calendar of events and their listing of Arctic researchers. So definitely check them out. And I know we have some representatives from them online um, if we have questions about Arcus later. Um, you are also on the IARPIC, <laughs> hopefully now that you're all in the IARPIC uh, webinar, we have the IARPIC collaborations and website and team. Many of us are involved in IARPIC and it's a really wonderful resource to um, interface with federal um, people working in the Arctic. Um, there's a, it's a really lovely space for feds and non-feds to get together and, and talk about Arctic research. And I see Bev popping in a lot of these links in the chat so thank you, Bev. One of our newer um, resources is our Arctic Community Engagement website um, that we developed in partnership with the Navigating the New Arctic program. Um, this was developed in response to some of the feedback that we were getting based on um, navigating the new Arctic and making, um, trying to make it more inclusive of indigenous voices. So um, we actually have put together a number of resources on, um, on the ACE website on um, kind of different ethical um, kind of considerations. We have a listing of programs across NSF that are willing to fund, um, that are looking to fund um, things like co-production of knowledge and, and Western scientists uh, working with indigenous knowledge holders. Um, that website also links to a dear colleague letter that we put together of what um, NSF is trying to do in the space to do better in the space. And I'd highly recommend um, going to check out that resource. Uh, finally, in February of this year, we funded the Navigating the New Arctic Community Office. Um, Greg, do you want to talk about the NNACO? Sure, thanks. Um, so the Navigating the New Arctic Community Office, that's uh, nna-co.org, if you want to go look up the website. Um, it's, it's at the University of Colorado, uh, as well as Arctic Pacific University and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's a, intended to be a, a basically a community nexus where researchers primarily that are funded through uh, the NNA program can come together, can just share concerns, ideas, try to coordinate, try to sort of establish a broader research support community. It's also a place where new investigators can come to learn more about the program. Uh, November 8th, 9th, and 10th is the next uh, NNA 
community meeting. It's the second of the two, the second one we've had. Um, both <laughs> both pandemic meetings. Now that I think about it. And um, that's another place for people to come and learn more about what's going on uh, in NNA and spark ideas for new collaborations. Um, the head of the office is Matthew Druckenmiller, uh, as I said, at the University of Colorado Boulder. One of the um, one of the other very important aspects of this office is it's another, along with ACE, another way that we are um, putting a lot of emphasis on linking our scientists with indigenous residents and other Arctic residents in a, in a respectful fashion um, that works for both sides. And they are developing um, ways of, of helping to transmit information about how to work well with, uh, with communities, both from the research Western trend researchers going to work with, uh, with Arctic residents and indigenous peoples and the other way around. Um, so hopefully we'll get some good, uh, good communication and good projects uh, growing over time through that effort. Thanks so much, Greg. And I think now I hand it off to Renee to talk about uh, COVID-19 and getting you all out to the field safely. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. I'm Renee Crane. I'm a program manager for the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program. I'm going to talk a moment about impacts of COVID-19 on field work so sponsored by our programs. Um, we initiated our response back in 2020 with a goal-based approach to protect the health of program participants and prevent the spread of COVID-19 to the Arctic, particularly to communities and research stations, while also helping researchers to meet their original goals. And the graphic um, on the right is a bar graph that shows the number of projects that went to the field each year. In 2019 was a, about an average, you know, normal year for us. The blue bars are number of projects in the field. Red is postponed projects and green are projects that were able to get a lot of work done by utilizing people who live in the area or projects, other research teams that were deploying and were able to service instruments or um, otherwise collect some data or samples for the group. So you can see in 2019, um, a typical year, that's about um, 139 projects. In 2020, only 48 projects made it to the field. 83 were postponed and 42 were able to get a lot of work done using that remote support option. And 2021 was closer to a normal year with 120 projects in the field. 22 were postponed and 19 used remote support. We do hope that people will continue to use remote support. It's been a great way to engage local communities or create new collaborations. Um, we expect 2022 to be more of a typical field, field year we'll spend about two or three years catching up on those postponed projects. And I have to say that, that in order to make this work, it, every one of the science program managers has worked individually with their PIs to talk about the impact of their project, to make, in some cases, supplements to carry through postdocs or graduate students. And everyone has worked really collaboratively to keep these projects going and get as many people to the field as we can. Um, the way we were able to implement field work was by having a, a really robust set of mitigation protocols. And I touched some of the text on the slide here, touches on some of those things. The protocols were specific to different regions. It started with a strict social distancing at home two weeks before going to the field, which means uh, not going out to bars and restaurants, but you could go, you know, go to the store and, and get things you need for your trip, but to wear masks and stay socially distanced. Um, and enable people to get ready for the field work, then have a negative COVID test before leaving to go to the field. And then once you get to that last stop before uh, field work, there's a quarantine process with a test early and a test at the end to rule out anyone having picked up COVID in the transit time to get to their research site. Um, so these protocols have been very effective in preventing anyone with COVID from going to the field. It's really important for our shared facilities where we have um, shared dormitories or cafeterias. And so we, we will continue to assess our strategies. In some locations, vaccines may be required like traveling to Greenland or vaccination status might change um, how long a, a quarantine duration is. We're continuing to work on that for next field season. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about impacts of COVID on field work. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over. Yeah, I don't think Terry's here, so I'll take the um, okay. the media slides. Uh, 
Okay. So this is just some more information about um, the, uh, the OPP newsletter and interactions with the media, just to remind folks about um, some of the resources and requests that uh, the media team for OPP has. Uh, OPP now has a quarterly newsletter. Um, I think hopefully somebody's putting that bit.ly, yep, <laughs> thanks Bev, in the chat for you guys to be able to sign up for it. Um, and it includes polar research highlights, funding opportunities. So basically the things that we're reviewing here with you guys, you'd get um, a, a little bit earlier with, with the direct links and access to. Uh, and then information about the latest happenings from around OPP and the National Science Foundation. So it is bipolar, it's, it's with the Antarctic group. Um, but it does highlight all, everything new that's happening uh, in the Arctic. And then uh, just always a reminder to everybody, just reach out and notify the OPP communications team about any media efforts that you guys have going on. Uh, it's both Terry and Sarah, and they're really great and interested in, in any of the stories, media, science publications, press releases, and they'll work with you to try to further amplify it through the NSF um, resources and social media. There's an OPP communications alias, so oppcoms at nsf.gov. And that's a great place to reach out to um, both of them to highlight anything that you guys have coming up. And especially with science publications, it is, I think, the most helpful if you guys reach out um, before they're published. And so you can work with um, both Terry and Sarah to amplify any of your publications. Um, but I think it is the most beneficial if you are initiating that process when you kind of, you have your proofs and you know when it's going to be published, but before it actually hits um, the journal itself. And I think with that, always, uh, we're now open for questions. I think the message that everyone has is just don't hesitate to contact anybody. I think we're always happy. Uh, and, and excited to hear from members of the community and just always eager to work with everybody. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and then we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. Oh, Colleen. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna uh, ask if I could make a quick ah. announcement on behalf of ANS before we open it up for questions. I'll be quick to make sure we leave plenty of time, but uh, one thing I just wanted to share with the community, this is something we've been, talking, oh, first I'll introduce myself. I'm Colleen Hafke. I'm a program director for the Arctic Natural Sciences Program. Um, and Mark and Reiner are the other two program officers for our program. And we had been talking a bit about wanting to get the word out to the community a bit more um, with respect to the Arctic Natural Sciences review cycle. Uh, we do not have deadlines similar to the rest of the um, core programs in the Arctic section. Um, however, uh, we have found that over the last um, several years, we have um, fallen into a pattern where we take proposals to panel typically in the fall and in the spring. Um, and what this means is that, uh, and what we have been telling PIs when they would contact us is, if you can get our uh, an Arctic Natural Science proposal to us by January 15th, we can guarantee that proposal makes it into our spring panel. If you can get a proposal to us by July 15th, we can guarantee that proposal will make it into our fall panel. And beyond that, we do our best to get the proposals um, you know, into the closest panel. And, um, but this is just the, the uh, kind of pattern we've fallen into. And so we wanted to start getting that message out and to point out that if you ever have a question about, um, how the timeline for your proposal review for the Arctic Natural Sciences Program, please reach out to Mark, Reiner, or I, and we would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, and that's it, thanks. Great, thanks, Colleen. Uh, any questions from folks? Uh, Bill, go ahead. Hey, I'm Bill Simpson, and I'm a PI of one of the NNA projects. And our project is studying uh, air pollution in cold and dark conditions and social systems and uh, questions around that. And we are planning on a field study that's here in Fairbanks starting in January. And uh, we, I guess it's a question maybe for Renee or someone there. We don't have support from the Arctic Logistics Office but we are a part of NSF NNA and we certainly 
support the idea of keeping COVID out of remote communities. So the question is, uh, do we have to fit with the rules of the Arctic Logistics Office, uh, quarantine, strict social distancing, or do those rules not apply to us because we don't derive any logistics funds from the Arctic, Arctic Logistics Office? Yeah, I think in, in practice, if you're not receiving support directly from the contractor that is um, supported by the Arctic Sciences section, then you are not obligated to follow the protocols that we've implemented for everyone who's traveling under uh, with support from the contractor. Um, but you certainly can model what you're doing um, after the uh, protocols that we've developed just to ensure that you're not putting anyone at risk. I think we all watched in horror as the late summer spike of COVID-19 in the state of Alaska took effect. And um, I think we received a lot of pushback from researchers who didn't wanna do such a long quarantine. But I think in the end, we I think people realized it was really um, one of the best ways to make sure that you you don't inadvertently and asymptomatically bring COVID into research stations or communities. So I encourage you to follow a similar protocol and we'd be happy to talk with you more, but you do not have to if you're not supported by our contractor. I mean, we'd be happy to, to talk to you more about best, best practices and make a good plan. And we've been working on one which involves a bunch of testing and, and um, enhanced masking and some other things like that, just to deal with that. We additionally, I mean, we're the study is in Fairbanks, and we're actually quite concerned about hospital capacity. It's right at borderline right now, and so we're intending, no matter what, to look in late December or in early December about the last time we could to see what the capacity is, and may have to make a decision based upon that if the hospitals are overwhelmed here in Fairbanks. So thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I did notice we had uh, both Terry, Adilian, and Sarah um, Eckhart join us. Uh, guys, we, we can move through your slides, but I can pop them back up real fast if you'd like to say uh, a couple words and introduce yourselves. That would be great. I'm very sorry um, that we weren't on earlier. Mm -hmm. Apologies. So um, we just wanted to let everyone know, if you weren't aware already, that um, OPP has a new quarterly newsletter. So um, featured in the newsletter, we generally um, focus on research highlights, recent research highlights from the community. Um, we list funding opportunities and any um, important program updates. And then we have just general information happening around the agency that might pertain to polar programs. So we encourage everybody to sign up. Um, right now it is quarterly. However, we do send out um, bulletins on a periodic basis if we have something important to announce. For example, we just sent one out um, around the events uh, that Polar Programs is having, the upcoming events. So please sign up. And then the next slide. Um, yeah, so if you all are contacted about um, either at the stations or anything important around media, please let us know about it. Um, you know, we do uh, fund Summit Station. Um, we are definitely involved with the research that you guys do. And so it would be helpful to just know about your story, about media events, um, any science publications and, and press releases for further amplification. We try and do as best we can um, with highlighting your research. And we'll do that through the various NSF channels and channels of our own. So uh, just wanted to let you know, you can contact us through that alias there, oppcoms at nsf.gov. Great, thanks so much. <laughs> um, Jack, you had your hand up next. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I think it's a follow-up to what Colleen uh, Hafke was saying about the ANS program and, and how the panels fit with the lack of deadlines. But I thought in the past few years, very often ANS and ARCs did joint panels. And does that same guidelines apply to ARCs or is that no longer true that you're doing joint panels? Do you wanna take this one, Greg? Go ahead. Yeah, Jack, thanks for that question. Um, so ARCs over the past few years, we've actually not been using panel uh, review 
for a variety of reasons. Um, what we've been focusing on instead is um, going out and getting lots and lots of mail reviews, what we call ad hoc reviews in, um, to provide us that broad view that we need to have in making choices. The One of the reasons for that is um, we're trying to make sure that um, we have the ability to give feedback back to you as a PI and, and others as PIs, of course, um, as in a timely fashion, while also dealing with the fact that our proposal proposals into the Arctic System Science Program tend to be fairly complex and they need a bit of a complex review. And um, given the, the, the timelines involved in, in that, we are trying to make sure that we're able to give you some responsive feedback. We do share proposals with Arctic Natural Sciences and often, um, and those can be proposals that come into ARCs or those that go into ANS, but um, those certainly go to panel. And we do have other, other proposals where if we are sharing it with another program and we feel that we need a panel review to help with that or the other program uses panels, then the proposals can sometimes go there. But as a matter of course, over the last few years, um, ARCs is not using panels. If we just if we uh, see a change in the in the way things are working uh, or the um, you know other circumstances that would lead us to change that process, we certainly could do so. But at this point, it's uh, it's not happening for us. So, thanks for clarifying. Any other questions from folks? We still have about fifteen minutes left. everybody all at once. <laughs> I'll make a plug that in case you're a polar researcher, there is also an Antarctic section uh, office hours later this week on Friday afternoon and more information is available on the NSF website. I did have a question about the, the quarterly newsletters. I think it's great that, that OPP is starting these. And could you just share a little bit again just for our benefit, but also for the group, the overall goals for that, and are there opportunities for groups to provide input to that, or you know, short stories on on one of the things, for example, that our group wants to do is make sure that we're reading as reaching as broad of a community as we can, in particular with our new or new renewal cooperative agreement. So I'm just wondering if if there are opportunities you know, to work on stories jointly with centers such as ours. I, I imagine there's others on the call that may be interested in similar opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking that question. So the purpose of the newsletter is really just to provide another channel where we can give our community, um, our audiences, whether it's the research community, the public, more information about our program and what we're doing. So we have limited channels here at NSF. We have our website. Um, we used to have our own social media channel, but that was shut down. So this is just another opportunity where we can blast our information out to the world, I guess. So we are always interested in, um, you know, what's going on in your world and how we can amplify that. So if you have information that you think is important that we should amplify or let people know about, please send it to us. You can send it to that email alias. Um, it may go in the newsletter. It could go somewhere else. You know, sure. we do have um, news on our NSF.gov OPP homepage. Again, it could be something for social media or an article. So um, definitely let us know about it. Thank you. And I also just plug the IRP Collaborations website as another great place to share information. The NSF uh, Arctic Science section newsletter is obviously an excellent place, but also so is IRP Collaborations. Um, so you can post information about your work or questions that you have there. David, go ahead. Hi, this is a bit more of a basic question, I guess, but I'm wondering if there's a preferred way that uh, you like to be contacted uh, regarding potential ideas and seeing if they're a fit for your program. Is it a, a one page summary um, and then potentially a meeting after that, or if you could shed in any light on that? Um, I can go, go ahead, ahead, Colleen. <laughs> go ahead, Colleen. I'll hand it off to you. All right. Um, 
So for Arctic Natural Sciences, you know, you can shoot us an email. Typically, we ask at that point to send us a one pager just so we can, um, you know, know what uh, kind of discussion we're going to be having. And then, um, and then, yeah, we're happy to get on the phone with you, get on a Zoom and talk more. Um, if you think it might be for you know, if you're trying to decide, is this a, is this Arctic natural sciences? Is this Arctic system sciences? Um, you can send it to the program officers for all of those programs. And we internally uh, pass it around and discuss who might be the best to take it on, or we can all meet with you. Um, it just depends. And um, yeah, Colleen. Yeah, I think you summed it up well. I, I think it's kind of important to realize that all program officers kind of operate differently. We have a lot of flexibility in how we manage our programs, but I think the one kind of standard is, you know, to reach us out by email so we can read your one pager and really kind of think um, about it um, and provide you with the best advice that we can after having some time to discuss. Um, I would also say that our website has really um, good descriptions of our programs so you get an idea of what the programs are looking for. Um, looking at the NSF public abstract search and seeing what has been funded by our programs in the past is a really good um, resource. But yeah, I think generally the email, the one pager, and then set up a call is, is kind of like the normal pathway for most program officers at NSF. Go ahead, Greg. And, and if I could just add, oh, Alan, go ahead. You started to talk before oh. I did. I was just going to say, if you reach out to one of us and send a one pager, it's also a great opportunity for us to be like, oh, and then this person might be interested, and then that person might be interested and do a little bit of that internal NSF networking as well. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, and then w when we do that, uh, David, the thing is that allows us to, and we do this routinely, one of these one pagers comes in, we often discuss it across, across programs, so that we can give advice to you and your fellow PIs about where a, where a, a good home might be. Or homes, because there might be might be many places that it could go, um, and that's true across all of the Arctic programs: social science, natural science, system science, etc. All right, great, thanks everybody. Um, we have about ten minutes left. Uh, any more additional questions? I'll just Anybody? add something real quick to yeah. Kate. Um, encouraging those of you with grad students who are considering applying to funding, please also encourage them to talk to the program officers in advance. That really helps with your application. I, I also know this wasn't specifically part of the question, um, but you know, when you submit your, your proposal, eventually you're, we, we send things out for review and, and they're judged both based on intellectual merit and broader impacts. I think that usually people spend a lot of time thinking about the intellectual merit and then the broader impacts comes later. And so we often will see one pagers that focus just on intellectual merit and not the full project that you might be considering. And including what your broader impacts are certainly can, and depending on who you're talking to maybe should include information about the broader impacts of your work as well, especially if they're very closely intertwined uh, together. So just some food for thought. Yeah, thanks, Alan. That's a really good point. Um, anyone else? Well, I know Bev has also uh, put information for the Antarctic office hours um, in the chat for folks who are polar and would be interested in attending those uh, later this week. Oh, Brendan, go ahead. Can you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I know... Uh, the Arctic section has struggled for a very long time with how to make clear um, where the overlap is and isn't between the Arctic system sciences and Arctic natural sciences. And I'm just wondering, is there a, a, a current best place where somebody entering this conversation might start to get their arms around that? So I can jump in and, and others can, can jump in too. Brendan, my answer to that would be what Colleen suggested earlier, our website and the solicitation have a lot of language that we've spent time crafting to try to help explain that. Um, but to some degree, I'd also say as a PI, I wouldn't spend as much time worrying about that as, as you might think, because one of the things that we're trying is to, it, there, there is overlap and that's deliberate. Um, to put it as bluntly as I can, you can't fall into an overlap 
but you can fall into a gap and we don't want there to be gaps. So if you put in your, you know, you've got a project and you're just not sure is this Arctic system science or Arctic natural science, send us that one pager and say that and we have the conversation and try to sort of see what's going on and give you the best advice. Very generally speaking, I would say the biggest difference is, uh, and Colleen in particular, correct me when I get this wrong, but if your project is focused on a specific process or a set of processes, but on the process level, especially, or a technique, that's most likely to be Arctic natural sciences. If you are interested in a project where multiple processes are working together, across different time and space scales, especially. It can be one locality with like, say the food web of a lagoon. That could be a system and that's system science. Um, it, or it could be some global circulation model that talks about climate uh, as a whole. That could also be a system science. But if you're interested in, in a process-based, more ANS, more system-based processes working together, more Arctic system science. And if you're somewhere in the middle, well, we do co-review things. Colleen, did I, did I mischaracterize that? No, I think that's how I would have described it as well. Yeah, and then we have an additional comment in the chat from Arena, uh, also asking when it is Alaska, but not quite below the, uh, or not quite above the Arctic Circle, does it go to EAR, GLD, or other places? I guess, how do you guys have those conversations in terms of what is Arctic and what is not? And I guess I'll- Near Arctic. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in quickly, others fill in too. But um, Irina, my answer to that would be if it is a project that is can tell us about the Arctic specifically, even if it's not necessarily in the Arctic, we wouldn't rule it out just a priori. Um, if it's not in the Arctic and wouldn't tell us anything about the Arctic itself, um, it's probably best sent to another part of, of NSF like uh, geomorphology, land use dynamics or something like that. But if it's, it can be outside the Arctic if it will tell us about the Arctic. Um, and the other, other way around is true too. It can be in the Arctic and tell us about how the Arctic connects with the rest of the world and still be okay. I'm looking at my fellow POs to see if anybody's cringing and it doesn't look like it. Okay. Thanks, that's useful. I, I, we were thinking to like, pitch it as a one picture and then like still like ask for a bit of advice on that too and then maybe it, it will go to like gld instead based on that interactions thanks great no thank you um so we have uh about five minutes maybe time for one or two more questions if folks have them Okay, going once, going twice. Uh, well, as we said before, I think we're always very um, open to receiving contact from you guys. Just reach out. I think if anyone has any additional questions, thank you so much for joining us um, today. We always appreciate it when people take time out to, to um, spend time and, and talk to us. Uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Liz uh, for some wrapping everything up. And thanks again to everybody. Thanks, Kate. Thanks to the whole Arctic Science section staff for joining us today. And thank you for all of you for coming and, and listening in um, and asking questions. The recording, as well as any links that were dropped in the chat, will be posted on the event page um, within the next couple of days. Uh, so you can check there. If you missed something, I will make sure that both halves of the recording end up there. Uh, also hope you join us on November 2nd for a program manager chat with the NSF Arctic Observing Network. Um, and yeah, if you've got questions, if there are particular webinars you'd love to see from IRFIC, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, thanks for your patience with our technical issues and hope to see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye.